hello everyone. Uh, welcome in the first afternoon session. So uh, we start with uh, Joan Chodera from, from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, who will be talking about teaching free energy calculations to learn. Thanks so much to Zoe and uh, to Gianni and his colleagues for organizing such a fantastic uh, uh, session. And um, thanks to you folks for coming back after lunch instead of going to beach to the beach. I hope that was the right decision. So I'm excited to talk to you about some of our work on teaching free energy calculations to learn. But first, we have to start off with what are we trying to accomplish? So my lab builds predictive modeling tools for drug discovery, and uh, we intend to actually design real drugs. Um, and the hope there is to actually meet the requirements of, uh, and there's many of them, of something that not only targets, you know, inhibits the particular target you're after, say you want to shut down a protease for SARS-CoV-2 to prevent the spread uh, or a serious infection of, of COVID disease, uh, but you also have to do all of these other things. It has to work in cells. If you want it to be orally administered, it has to be highly soluble. You have to stick around in blood for long enough to actually do the thing to the virus. And then there's a whole host of safety considerations you have to meet as well. So there's actually a huge number of objectives you have to meet at the same time. But usually one of the hardest things to do is to actually pursue potency, but it's just one part of this multifactorial design problem that you have to consider. And to do this, you have to uh, design a whole cas cascade of assays that you have to use uh, to measure whether the molecules you're generating are actually uh, useful in achieving those goals that you set out and that target candidate profile I just showed you. So you have, have to not only you know, design and synthesize the compound, you have to assay it against the target. You generally want to see what it looks like when it's bound to the target. There's a lot of other things you have to do as well. And if it meets certain criteria, then you can do more expensive assays. These are things that involve uh, cell assays and BSL-3 laboratories where people have to wear special protective equipment like movie ET. Um, and then if it, things go well there, you can also do animal studies to figure out if it actually works in an animal disease model and if it actually uh, has the right kind of, of pharmacokinetics to, to be able to um, justify taking it all the way to humans uh, and into clinical trials. So this is a huge set of objectives we have to have to achieve. So most of our time in drug discovery is spent in this cycle. It's called design, make, test, analyze, D DMTA cycle, where we go around and around in circles at this first tier, trying to make compounds that are potent enough to actually uh, want to progress them past that first tier and onto the second tier. And then hopefully we've done our job at optimizing those other properties. So eventually we get a very small number of compounds here. Um, some of them might be in vivo tool compounds that you can use to study the mechanism of biology if they don't meet all the requirements for your drug. But in the end, you really want to get into the preclinical phase. So it gets very expensive from here on out. This whole process, you might make no more than 2,000 compounds. So it's important to understand that in real drug discovery, you're, you're never going to have a large data problem. Um, we heard a couple of talks yesterday about you know, what are ways in which we can make very data efficient models, for example, perhaps by pre-training with a lot of synthetic data and then retargeting using a smaller num amount of, of real data. But by and large, we really have to make models that are extraordinarily data efficient if we ever want to use them for drug discovery. The cool thing is that we have a lot of structural information that we can leverage. Just in the last 10 years, the Protein Data Bank has 100,000 new structures. It's more than doubled in size. And of course, with methods like AlphaFold, now homology modeling or comparative modeling is, is perhaps extended much further than it used to be so that we can really use structures and rely on structures to help us do this most important part of targeting uh, the affinity of these molecules, improving the affinity, and keeping that affinity good while we're working out all of these other problems that are a lot harder to predict straightforwardly. So uh, what can we do with this? Well, we can use, um, you, you know, often in this design make taste test analyze cycles, we're doing exactly the same operation over and over again. We take a particular compound that was a pretty good molecule, but not good enough. We have to take it apart retrosynthetically. So we come up with a reasonable synthetic route where we can make a ton of this intermediate, and then we can bang out 20, 30, 40 analogs in a very rapid succession because we have a ton of this, and then all of those are just one-step reactions using a lot of in-stock building blocks, for example, at Enamine over in Ukraine. We worked with them extensively as part of the COVID moonshot to develop this first-generation SARS-CoV-2 inhibitor, and then you'll use computational techniques to figure out which of these things are actually going to bind best. I'll tell you a little bit about how we do this with free energy calculations. We heard a little bit about these alchemical free energy calculations earlier today, but by and large, you're trying to bias yourself towards success, towards more, more potent compounds, and hope that you can actually enrich the, the set of compounds you synthesize, which are very limited in nature, uh, to bind better or to at least maintain the potency while you're working out things like solubility and pharmacokinetics and other properties. So we use this class of uh, alchemical free energy calculations in which we take the Hamiltonian and we modify it using some sort of alchemical lambda coordinate. 
And uh, this lambda allows us to turn off or change the interactions between your ligand and the rest of the environment, the protein and solvent and everything else in an all atom simulation uh, in a series of stages through unphysical routes. So it's, you can't do this kind of uh, conversion into this dummy molecule that doesn't feel the rest of the environment, or often you turn one molecule into another molecule by changing some substituents over here using this continuous alchemical coordinate. And it turns out that this gives you the entire, you're basically taking the free energy, the ratio of partition functions, and then turning it into little ratios of partition functions that are very easy to estimate uh, because they're very similar to each other. So you take little staged intermediate steps. You can do this through a variety of different methods, non-equilibrium, equilibrium. There's tons of great theory here that relates statistical inference and statistical machine learning, but it's so much faster than actually waiting for the drug-like to the, the drug -like molecule to associate or dissociate, which would take hours in reality. Um, and then that would be like millions of years in computer time. The cool thing is that these alchemical methodologies are now pretty robust. Um, at least for very well-behaved proteins and chemistries, they can give reasonable accuracies, like one and a half kcals per mole, perhaps, either from relative or absolute free energy calculations. R relative calculations are where I have two ligands that I'm just changing some decorations, but I keep the scaffold and the binding mode in the pocket the same. Absolute calculations are where I have, have to turn off the entire ligand, so they're a lot more expensive. There's a lot more of thermodynamic length to traverse in order to do so, but they're still reasonably accurate with modern molecular mechanics force fields. But there's still a limit to this accuracy, right? If we increase the accuracy even further from, you know, maybe one and a half to two kcals per mole, maybe all the way to half a kcal per mole, we could speed things up enormously or drastically reduce the number of compounds we would need in order to reach very potent molecules. So this is by and large a, a big goal of these alchemical free energy calculations is to make them as reliable and robust and extend their domain of applicability as broadly as possible. They're not just useful for driving potency or affinity, though that's most of what has been used for uh, to date. They're also very useful for things like designing selective ligands. It turns out to treat a lot of cancers, you generally wanna come up with kinase inhibitors that inhibit very specific kinases, but you have 500 of these kinases in humans that all look, have ATP bonding sites that look the same. And so as designing for selectivity is very difficult for a human and should be something that easily can excel with uh, computational methods. You can also do things like if you're just predicting the change of a few atoms, you can do the same on the receptor side and ask, does this patient mutation in this particular type of cancer actually modify the binding of my drug? And then we could say, all, you know, here's a bunch of mutations that metastatic cancer patients at, at MSKCC have had. Um, we can ask how, how all of these other mutations, we've only characterized this one really well, how do all of these other mutations modulate the ability of, of patients to respond to this drug, which could be very useful. And then there's all sorts of other cool stuff going on with biologics by optimizing thermostability. And uh, as we get more and more structures for toxicity targets, we're gonna be able to extend these techniques to saying something about computational toxicity panels as well. And there's all sorts of other fun things you can use these methods for. Same theory, same approaches, so it's worthwhile investing in making them systematically more accurate. Now, the problem is that we often rely on force fields like this, which are very different from the one that Liz showed you yesterday. Um, these are generally saying basically everything is harmonic or a lower order cosine expansion, uh, getting rid of all the electrons. And then I'm using something that was fast on the PDP-11 to represent my Leonard Jones uh, uh, repulsion and uh, steric dispersion interactions. And then I have some sort of Coulomb model here. So this is a very simple force field. It's super fast, but it is probably responsible for a lot of the loss of accuracy that we see. Um, and we'd like to do more. So first I have to take a little diversion about where force fields come from. Usually you take graduate students and put them into the meat grinder. And then outside of this comes a, uh, a, a force field that you desperately hope people will use. Um, if you look at just the force field papers that went into the current generation of recommended amber force field family parameters, it's something like 100 human years went into manually tweaking with partial computational support of optimization. And you really can't extend them very easily. Now, they're meant to all be compatible with each other, but they were all optimized independently, so they're probably not achieving the highest accuracy. Um, we really want to try to bring this problem into the modern era. Um, really, we'd like to do what Liz showed you yesterday of like, let's just run SciPy Optimize and then be done with it. Um, if you also look at the force fields that are used for drug discovery, it turns out GAF-1, the general amber force field, was finished when I started graduate school in 1999. We're still awaiting completion of the second generation of it, but this is the entire zoo of chemical moieties that went into that. And if 
you know, chemistry has moved on beyond what was, what was popular then. And if your drug doesn't look like these bits, then it's not gonna do well. You're gonna have a bad time with this force field. And because the parameter fitting code was never released and introducing new atom types is really problematic because you have to include all of these weird torsion combinations. It's just really hard to extend. And I'd been very, you know, very, this is an older uh, example, but I think a very clear one from the old TensorFlow Keras API, like you, just a few lines of code, you say, here's a data set that somebody has spent their time curating. I'm just gonna partition it according to best practices. I'm gonna define a new model that has some, you know, new science in it by using a really nice, efficient composition of different abstractions. And then I'm going to use some best practices to optimize it, tell it how to score the loss, uh, measure the accuracy, then I'll fit it and then I'll evaluate it. That's a whole research project, right? We don't have this kind of thing for biomolecular modeling and simulation, but it would be really cool if we did, where we could just define a new force field and then somebody's collected a nice data set for us. We just run the optimization, the sci-fi optimizer or whatnot, and then uh, we're done. That would be great. Well, it turns out we're trying to build these tools as part of this open force field consortium. This is funded by a bunch of industry and um, uh, federal funding sources to build new generation open source toolkits that help us, as well as data sets, that help us do uh, all of these tasks in a very simple manner. They're producing this Python toolkit, which I'll encourage you to go in and check out. Um, and everything is done in the open. All the science that they're doing is completely shared. So we're not gonna end up with this weird vulcanized infrastructure problem. And even, even over just the first generation, they were able to, to take things that were pretty nasty at the beginning of, of uh, this whole process in, uh, in 1999 and take them really improve the accuracy on um, even in their first generations by using just better technologies to do most of everything without even huge refits. So what we really need though is to, again, to take this into the modern uh, generation of using machine learning frameworks that will, uh, that are really well suited to doing these kinds of tasks in chemistry. And a lot of folks have talked about these graph models obviously being a natural way to encode the kinds of not only invariances and equivariances, but also the equivalences of chemically equivalent atoms which should receive similar parameters. Um, and it turns out you can, in, in our first foray into this, we were just looking at how well can we reduce partial charges, which are something that are, is normally a pain in the ass to do uh, in actually generating parameters, especially if you wanted to do it for bigger things like hosts or biomolecules in a consistent way. It turns out if you just try to predict the charges directly, you do a really terrible job of it. But if you put them into even a very simple physical model where I'm, instead of predicting the charges, I'm predicting an electronegativity, which is how much I like negative electrons, and then the hardness, which is how much I resist taking up or giving up too many electrons, and then just solves self consistently, consistently with a simple convex optimization, I can do just as well as I can in uh, the different, or it's equivalent to the difference between using the OpenEye toolkit and the Amber Tools uh, SQM solver for these, these same AM1BCC charge models. So you can actually do really well by just using a very simple physical model and learning some of the parameters that go into it. And I think this is a, a really nice story about how data efficient models are gonna combine some sort of physical model and physical insight with some learnable parameters that don't let you go off the rails. So you can take this a lot further. You can try to learn every part of a force field by using a graph model to learn continuous atom embeddings, which are different from the atom types, which are discrete forms that people used to try to encode all the chemical information on. Instead, I have a vector that represents how different this oxygen is from this oxygen, for example. Um, and it'll learn everything about its local atom environment. Obviously, there's still challenges in really long range things like dyes and, and conjugation. But from each one of those, you do some symmetry preserving pooling because a torsion should be the same parameters, whether you read it forward or backwards. And then from, from that vector, you get from the symmetry encoded, encoded gen genesee pooling, you can predict the torsion parameters by just a feed forward neural net. And this is very modular in that it allows you to take um, uh, both modules and add them as you'd like for polarizability or for other parameters. It's also fully end-to-end -end differentiable. So you can link it to whatever you want to fit an objective function. And you, know, you can go wild here to ask questions about what if I add another module for uh, Druda oscillators, for example, for point polarizability. So this is fitting an entire force field uh, using this, this tool now called Espaloma, uh, using these graph models. It's almost where what I had showed you before as an inspiration. You can really easily define new parameters and new modules you'd like to, uh, to move to extend this, and then you can fit it and train it in your laptop in about half an hour. Um, what's cool is that you can first reproduce older force fields, molecular mechanics force fields that were produced through these janky Fortran codes. And so one of the obvious uses is just using it to replace a lot of this old aging infrastructure that's difficult to port to new architectures. And it does a really good job of memorizing from examples. 
But what's cool is that you can fit quantum chemistry directly. So if you're just trying to use a simple uh, squared loss in uh, quantum chemical energies, it turns out you can train it on a wide variety of different data sets and do significantly better than current generation force fields. I'll just take you through a couple of these really quickly. So you start with a very simple chemical space that just has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And it turns out you can do quite well, much better than any of the existing small molecule force fields that we've been playing with. Uh, it's a well-represented atom space, so that's, that's great. What about other things like more drug-like molecules? In fact, this was the training set that was used for open force field 1.2.0, but we're already doing better than it simply because we have a more nuanced view of learning what the different environments are for these atoms. Uh, we also tried this uh, heterocyclic aromatic uh, bicycles of the future um, data set where the normal force fields do extremely poorly, 8 kcals per mole, uh, whereas we do extremely well because it turns out there are some non-aromatic molecules in this data set. And the quantum chemistry will take them and be uh, out of the plane and into the pyramidal regime um, through these weird nitrogen environments. And just by having a few examples of that, it was enough for Espaloma to pick up on uh, how these are different from the standard classes of atom types where human chemists had completely missed this kind of nitrogen being present anywhere. Um, you can also show it things like peptides or cyclic peptides, and it can do a much better job than hand-optimized amber force fields that are now 20 years old. Um, actually, maybe more than that. I think it's 40 years old uh, at this point um, uh, since the first amber. And you can put them all together. You can say, I'm going to train on both small molecules and peptides, and then produce something that is consistent and produces stable trajectories. This whole simulation, everything except for the water, which is very hard, uh, as Liz uh, mentioned, um, uh, is simulated with this Espaloma force field that was just trained on peptides and small molecules. You can also do free energy calculations. In this case, we use the Amber 14, uh, 14 SB force field for the protein simply because it was hard to replace it uh, with uh, Espaloma parameters. But we used small molecule parameters for this kinase inhibitor that come from uh, this Espaloma joint model I showed you. And it already does about half a kcal per mole, which is significantly better than the 0.91 kcals per mole for the open force field force field. Now, you could go beyond training it on just quantum chemistry, right? You can go also to train it on free energies by using MBAR to estimate what your gradient is at every perturbed value of your parameters, uh, and then optimize on that, too. And you can show that you can train not only to, to uh, uh, quantum chemi chemistry, but also to free energies. Now, we're really excited about the next generation of force fields, though, where we go beyond these terrible harmonic approximations and you know, use the wonderful work that Olas and other folks have been doing on quantum machine learning potentials. Um, and so we've been trying to take the first steps of what, how do we replace at least some of the system, and usually it's the ligand we care about most, with quantum chemical level um, through these quantum machine learning force fields. So we've, we've created this weird mechanical embedding system where we take out the MM part for the ligand and add back the, the NE2X in this case, and uh, learn, to correct, whoops, learn to correct that for, uh, we run a normal MM free energy calculation and then perturb to as if we had run this with the, the ligand replaced with QML. And it turns out that also does really well, about 0.47 kcals per mole. So what ha is happening here is that you've got these weird peptide-like bonds that have some sort of double bond character in certain, uh, certain uh, geometries, and they're conjugating all the way through these rings, and we're totally missing that with independent torsions that are low order cosine expansions. So you can see this if you look at the two-dimensional distributions of these. Uh, there's some coupling between all of these, as well as shifts in those distributions when you go to the QML level of theory. So it's really giving you a better representation of what's going on with your ligand. And of course, our hope is that this will get fast enough to be practical and basically replace MM for most everything we want. Uh, so we're hoping that eventually the tensor cores will get to FP32. That would be really helpful because they're useless now. Um, but not only that, we need better kernels. And you heard from Raimondas yesterday about how NNP ops is really speeding up a lot of these calculations. Raimondas has managed to make this so fast that it's only about two and a half times slower than GPU MD if you're using a two femtosecond time step. It's ridiculously fast, up to about 100 nanoseconds per day, where you're running this with uh, the ligand with quantum machine learning and the rest of the system with uh, regular MM. Um, we want to make it as easy as possible for people to use. So uh, Peter Eastman has worked hard to make this simple create mixed system allow you to say, okay, I'm just going to replace my ligand atoms with QML potential, and then I'm done. I'm ready to run. And so this OpenMM8 beta, which has this entire stack of accelerated kernels, should be ready next week. So if you want to play with it, keep an eye out. Um, the other thing that's really cool is, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could eventually get to this future where we don't have to worry about MM at all? It's weird to live in this intermediate regime where we have MM and ML. Let's just throw out MM completely, blow it all up. 
Um, and so this is, you know, our first step towards this is just simulating a droplet because it's currently very difficult to do fully periodic simulations. They're very slow right now. And just asking the question, what would free energy calculations look like if the entire system is represented with QML? And here we're doing something you couldn't normally do with a normal molecular mechanics free energy calculation. I'm breaking a bond and I'm forming another bond. And I'm asking what the quantum chemical and the free energy of the environment changes for that in, in rearranging these tautomer species. So it turns out because they're free of singularities, you can go back to the old days, the 1980s, and actually do linear mixing of your two Hamil end state Hamiltonians. And it works just fine. You just need some restraints to prevent your ligand from, your atoms from drifting away when they become dummy atoms. And you can start, and it turns out, you know, these, these original uh, ANI models were not intended for liquid phase simulation. Olis has done a lot better uh, with the recent ones with tautomer energies as well. And if you're training on a, a subset of data, training to the free energies of rearranging these atoms for the tautomer, you can significantly improve the, the affinity or uh, the, the accuracy of those uh, tautomer free energies. And so you're actually training based upon the free energy between those states and tweaking this last, last few layers of this quantum machine learning potential to take us from seven kcals per mole to about three kcals per mole. And we st still need to go further, but I think this idea is really going to be useful in thinking about how to change this paradigm where previously all of the practitioners in free energy calculations for drug discovery would simply use a published force field and then keep using it even after they get new data. And certainly we want to completely change that where as you get more experimental data, you worked hard for that data. So you should be able to retrain your force field, tweak it to give better data efficient uh, predictions for your next molecules to come. So I think we really have an opportunity as a field here. We really have to invest in a few things like making the tools useful for people. People just want to take a machine learning model off the shelf and actually use it for the problems that they care about. Can we make it practical to do that? Um, and can we make it easy to go between these ML and MD frameworks? So I think there's a lot of challenges that we can solve. And I'd just like to say I'm super excited because we have this opportunity from the NIH to actually do drug discovery within this open biotech that we've created called the AI-driven structure-enabled antiviral platform, where we can take drug discovery data and actually make it open. We can also take models and deploy them internally to actually drive the selection of molecules. So if you folks have interesting drug discovery uh, computational techniques that you'd like to see in practice, come talk to me, um, and we can maybe think about hooking them up to live models and generating some great open data for you. So there's a lot of preprints and code available. I'll make these slides available too. Thanks, thanks to all of you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, John. Wow, what a talk. Um, yeah, we have a couple of questions. Thank you for the great talk. And Open Force Bill, I think it's really amazing. I think there's so much potential. Um, I'm curious. So you mentioned. It's a great pun. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, force field being too simple for protein ligand interaction. So do you think if we add um, some medicinal chemistry inspired terms like cation pi interaction, pi pi interaction that are like um, kind of like specific and frequently happens in proton ligand interaction that'll help? That's a great question. I think Liz has the answer to some of those uh, from long, long years of experiments. But I think what the exciting thing is we can start to ask these questions by taking these modules of Espeloma and turning on or turning off different things and refitting the whole force field. You really need the machinery to say, what happens if I did add a pi pi stacking term and then refit the whole force field consistently? People haven't been able to do that because there's so much hand tweaking that goes into the force fields we're using today. So I think that or the sci pi optimize approach, you need some way of, of automating those experiments and then measuring the statistical rigor, whether or not that really is worth it or not. And so I, I think we're finally positioned to start asking those questions. Oh yeah, thank you so much. Um, actually, I have one more question. Can I? Oh yeah. So um, uh, you also mentioned about chemical space being super large, so that we really cannot like span all those uh, chemical space. So I think coarse graining can really help, but at the same time, because protein ligand interaction uh, involves a lot of like detailed interaction that includes only two atoms, maybe coarse graining. Um, you know, might cause loss in some details. So uh, I w I'm curious about your opinion on this. So I, I'm a full believer in fully atomistic simulations. We try to use as much detail as we think is relevant for modeling the, the actual biophysical experiment. So I'm, I'm fully behind uh, using the fully atomistic system, but then 
learning as accurate a potential as we can, both from the quantum chemistry and from the experimental data that we have access to. Right. Thank you so much. Chris? Great talk. Um, I have a question that is kind of related to the previous one. Um, in the way people used to think about force field in the past, they had like this form, uh, uh, for instance, using uh, a Lennard Jones potential, which we know is incorrect to begin with. And, um, and the way the philosophy was, okay, so the Lennard Jones potential is the garbage yard of the potential. And the torsional potential is, oh, it's, let's say the, it's the antechamber of the garbage yard and the torsional potential is the garbage yard, the kind of the adjustment variable. And then you have all this one four potential. Wouldn't it be a better idea to rethink from the start and for instance, include uh, all these effects like uh, cation pi, uh, uh, um, how would you say a charge transfer uh, from the beginning at, but at a limited cost. I mean, the cool thing is, you know, there's this whole generation of, of class two force fields like MMFF that had tons of higher order terms couplings here. I think Liz's force field also uses higher order couplings too. People had just shied away from that because they were worried about the number of parameters. They're order n in cost in, to compute. So it, it's basically free for us because it's dominated by these uh, non-bonded interactions, the cost of real calculations. So I think now that we can generate very large quantum chemical data sets, we're not worried about the number is a parameters. Certainly, uh, the more, um, the better you can do at designing really good physical terms to potentially include, the more data efficient it presumably will be by being able to generalize. That's a good, good hypothesis. Um, and it's just a matter then of throwing in everything that you think might be important, turning it on and off and evaluating how, how much it really reduces the error on things you care about that are out of your training sample. So I think we just need to do those experiments as a field now and just kind of regress over different functional forms that, that might be useful. We've been talking about fully Bayesian ways to do this too. It's still very expensive, but you could, in principle, instead of using a loss function, use a likelihood function, put some physical priors on, and then compute the weight of model evidence given experimental data uh, by training these. It's still hard to do that with quantum chemical data, but for experimental data, it might be possible. You can build a model uh, for example, things like any body dispersion, predicting the charges, the volumes, and then improve your Leonard Jones. And see, see how much it's worth it, right? Uh, yeah, I really love this Espaloma approach. I think that's really the future. Um, I wonder, do you have some intuition for what kind of energy it's a very related question. What kind of energy terms work well? So right now you're using like this uh, class one MM. Yep. What if, if we try to plug this into, into the model that was uh, shown by, for instance, Matthias Ruff, right? Uh, like, can you, can you emit uh, cubic polynomial coefficients with this? Would that work? That's a, a good question. Actually, the student started with that and then I, I convinced him to come back to this. And um, so I, I think it, it is possible to, to produce general models that um, for many different domains, I will say that there's some tricks in what you actually predict instead of predicting these parameters directly. You predict other easily more learnable prop, uh, parameters, but it seems to just be for, because Adam is a sh shitty optimizer to be frank. And so you get stuck uh, too many times if you have a weird shaped landscape. So some of this are, there's parameterization tricks here that might be necessary to be able to easily optimize. Those might be overcome with some of the awesome stuff that Tony May and Ben Lankul are doing with Langevin integrators to train these models to make them more robust. So I, I think, uh, yes, the answer is, I think it will work pretty well, but you have to be careful about how you train it. Thank you. Okay, I'll take one last question before we move. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, could you comment on uh, uh, transition metal based targets? So how your approach uh, will improve on those that are notoriously diff difficult to, to work with, like if you have iron or copper? Oh, transition metals are terrible, but I'm, that's why I'm hoping other people like Tony will solve that problem for us, okay. right? No, I, I think honestly that there's so many weird tricks for MM that I'm just, I, I think it's better to go beyond that and go to these higher order QML models where it's learning something that's data efficient with 
you know, the equivariant models that Tess has introduced that um, I think could do a much better job of learning what ligand fields are, for example. So I, I think I'm just gonna wait for the QML models to be efficient enough. Okay, let's thank John again for a great talk.